I was recently sitting in Starbucks, fooling around on my laptop, and overheard a group of students discussing what scared them and why. Hearing this caused me to try and think back to the first time in my life I was truly scared. I guess I'm getting old because it took me a few minutes to think of it, but once I did, I figured I'd better write it down so I'd never forget again. Just to prove to myself I hadn't just undergone one of the most useless exercises in my life, it seemed like a good idea to send you a copy so you could share it with other people. I'm not completely sure what my age was, maybe as young as 8, but more likely closer to 10. I had been foaming at the mouth waiting for Halloween to arrive. It had been my favorite holiday for as long as I can remember. I had known who I was going to dress up as after I saw the first Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire at the theater. My parents took me to Walmart as soon as they put out the costumes. It wasn't the best and looked a bit stupid on my fat little body, but I wore it with pride. My friends and I sat at lunch every day, excitedly discussing what houses we were going to and the candy we were hoping to get. Even though trick-or-treating door-to-door was already falling out of favor, mainly due to the fault of the media repeating nonsense stories of poisoned and razor-blade-filled candy, in my small town, parents were more than happy to see their kids getting out of the house and away from their gaming consoles. Even then, the younger ones still had to have their mothers chaperone them around the neighborhood and make sure no boogeyman grabbed them, or at least that's what we thought then. Since I was going out with my older brother, my folks weren't worried about us. When we got out of school that afternoon, I ran the two blocks home and began getting my stuff ready for later. After dinner, my brother and I jumped into our costumes and lined up in the living room so our mom could take some pictures. Every second that was stuck in my house was torture. When she finally let us go, it was already beginning to get dark. I ran to the school playground to meet my friends and my brother split off for me to catch up with his. Happy to be free from the eyes of our parents for a while, we went from house to house holding out our bags and occasionally making smart aleck comments to the people whose candy we didn't approve of. Once or twice we had a clash with an adult because of her behavior, but being anonymous under our disguises, we were emboldened to mouth off to them and run away. Moving forward was important because we had school in the morning, so most of us had to be home by 9. Not to mention we still had to let our parents inspect our candy before we could eat any. Of course, we ate some anyway, but we knew the faster we moved, the more houses we could hit, so we did. As we began to circle around the house on the opposite side of the street, we were passing an empty plot of land about the size of two lots. A building company had just recently broken ground and several tall hills of sand were located throughout the cul-de-sac. For some reason, I happened to glance over at the empty land and noticed a tall man dressed in black standing behind one of the sand hills. He didn't move at all and at first I thought he was some kind of decoration. But when I looked away to get my friend's attention and looked back, he was gone. When my friends didn't see him, they started making fun of me, but I knew what I'd seen. I tried to act like his disappearance didn't bother me, but I was already shaken up. I did my best to forget and continued my nocturnal assault on Candy. We moved pretty swiftly going from house to house, but once again as we approached the middle of the block, the dark, scary figure came back into my view. I was relieved to hear my friends acknowledge his existence this time. He remained stock still as he watched from the backyard of the house directly across the street. Not a one of us moved and we continued to silently stare at each other. This battle of fear went on for over a minute before he slowly began walking towards us. We hightailed it out of there before he completed his first step. I remember looking back at one point and not seeing him behind us, but I wasn't stopping until I couldn't run anymore. We all hit the wall around the same time. Coincidentally, we were almost back right where we'd started that night. Bent over with my hands and my upper legs, I struggled for every bit of air I could get. Even though we were still very afraid, we joked with each other, laughing probably in relief. Once I was able to finally breathe somewhat normally, I stood upright. If I recollect correctly, I was making a joke about one of the other guys, probably Steve. He was a common target for our humor and I happened to look across the street to the playground. I was mid-sentence when I noticed the shape of a person standing just out of the glare of a streetlight. I couldn't be sure if it was our stalker up until I stepped over a few inches, so I could see without the chain link fence blocking their upper body. As I moved to get a clearer look, my friends watched me closer, afraid to breathe until I passed judgment on what I was seeing. The person didn't move this entire time. 
This is until I got into a position to get an unobstructed view. The moment we got a clear eye-to-eye -eye view of one another, the man stepped into the direct glow of the lamp allowing me to see him fully. All I could say was run. Unfortunately, this time we split off in different directions, likely toward each of our homes. At least, that's where I was headed. Although I was moving as fast as my fat little body could carry me, some unknown feeling made me look back to see where the man in black currently was. I imagine each one of us was convinced he was hot on our tails, but I saw him turn nonchalantly and begin walking in the direction I had seen Steve and Brian run in. They must have seen him behind them because I heard Steve in the distance let out a scream and yell, Oh, dude, run! A few seconds later, I had made it to the perceived safety of my front yard. My lungs burned so bad, I just dropped flat on my back and spent a couple of minutes getting myself back together. As I entered the front door, I was still huffing a bit. My brother was already back home, and when he saw the state I was in, he laughed at me and said, What's wrong? The boogeyman chase you? Did the little baby get frightened by all the monsters? He said it all in a very condescending baby talk type tone. He was being his usual idiot self, but I was too distracted by what had just happened to be mad at him. All the excitement and running I'd been doing had left me exhausted. I just walked into the kitchen and dropped my bag of candy on the floor in front of my folks and walked upstairs to bed. I was barely able to get out of my costume, but I eventually did and quickly fell asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I dreamed that the phone was ringing out in the hall, but since I was so tired, I couldn't wake myself up to see if the ringing was real. When I came down the next morning to eat breakfast, I was still a little groggy. While I sat at the table waiting for my food, my dad asked me when I had last seen Brian the night before. As soon as he said this, I was instantly sucked back in time. Every second of the night flashed through my memory like a video on fast forward. All the fear I'd felt was right there with me, as if it had only just happened that minute. I wasn't sure why he was asking me this, but I was terrified it had something to do with the man in black. Although I was afraid of what I'd heard, I asked him why anyways. He answered in a calm voice that his parents had called here looking for him last night because he never came home from trick-or-treating. My heart started pounding and I could feel sweat beating up on my forehead. I could see the fear emitting from my parents' faces. Even though I wasn't sure what it all meant, I knew it couldn't be good. All I said was that we had gone trick-or-treating and when we'd had enough, we'd split up and went our separate ways. That was the last time I'd seen any of my friends. I'm still not sure they'd believe me, but they had no reason not to. The urge simmered quietly inside of me, the urge to blurt out the whole crazy episode, every little detail, but I suppressed it. I had no idea what Brian was doing. Maybe he decided to run away. But I sure didn't want he or any other kids at school to think I was a crybaby tattletale. If it turned out that teenager that had chased us around and scared us did something to him, I didn't want him and his buddies to find me and beat me up. These are some of the crazy things that go through a kid's young mind. I'm pretty sure it was a teenager dressed up in some outfit and my friends probably believed the same thing, even if no one said it. No matter if it was an older kid dressed up, it didn't make it any less terrifying. After all, this was the kind of nonsense teenagers did to little kids, isn't it? For all I knew, it could have been my brothers chasing us around. He seemed to be rather knowledgeable about what was going on that night. At that point, that was the extent of the experience I'd had in that area. I wasn't quite old enough to realize life got any worse. I had yet to discover how cruel and terrible adults could be to one another, and certainly not to children. In my world, the adults were the authorities and the older kids were the ones who bullied or beat you up. Things never got any darker than that. Rumors surrounding Brian's disappearance tore through the school. We were all a little scared and confused about the adults' reactions. Their attempts at stopping the panic from spreading was pointless. Every kid present that day could read the fear on their faces and just because we weren't all old enough to know why it was there didn't stop us from seeing it. One by one, Brian's friends were called to the office. A pair of police officers were joined by a counselor as they asked each of us a load of questions. Most of them were about the previous night. Despite the immense pressure on us, no one mentioned the man in black and what had happened. 
We never discussed it or practiced together what to say, it just seemed to be a given. It wasn't until I got home from school that I heard. My mom sat me down and told me that Brian was dead. Apparently during a search of the woods that ran between our side and his side of the neighborhood, his body was discovered lying in the creek bed at the bottom of a giant hill. We used that area to pass back and forth to each other's houses all the time. The hill was actually one side of the super high creek bank. Kids in that neighborhood had been climbing up and down both sides of that creek, leaving a few well-established trials probably since before I was born. If I hadn't already been afraid, hearing this definitely left me paralyzed. My mom asked me in a very concerned sounding voice if I understood what was going on. I just nodded and said nothing. Looking back on that, I'm surprised I didn't start bawling. I think I was just too afraid. As far as if I understood what was happening, I certainly did. Now that they found Brian dead, it was way too late to tell anyone what we had experienced. Every adult in town was going to be furious if we said anything now and my parents would have grounded me until I was 18. Just like a kid, more worried about being punished than his dead friend. That evening on the news, the story of Brian's death was the hot lead. From what I can remember, nothing was said about anybody pushing him or disposing of his body in the creek. The theory they had at the time and the decision the authorities eventually came to was that it had all been a horrible accident. The assumption was that he was running, in a hurry to get home, and tripped on his overloaded trick-or-treat bag causing him to tumble down the steep hill, breaking his neck. Hearing this reminded me of a moment that night before when I had done something similar. I was in a full speed run fleeing the final time from the scary man and tripped on my bag of candy. I very nearly went head first onto the pavement but I caught myself at the last second and stopped myself from wiping out. Once I had thought back on that, their explanation seemed possible and for several years after that, I decided that was what had happened. The weeks following Brian's death was stressful, however, with the passage of time, my life was taken up with other equally as important life-altering situations. As I grew older, I would slowly lose my innocence and become the angst-ridden teenager many of us end up becoming. One particular eye-opening thing happened as I sat with my parents watching some cookie-cutter TV drama. Honestly, I wasn't paying very close attention until something about the show caught my eye. A man was holding a woman at gunpoint, and he had something sheer covering his face. This image drew me back to that Halloween night. For a moment I wasn't sure why, but then the answer clicked in my head. The man we had been running from was wearing the same thing or something very similar on his face. This is why his face had looked so scary. I asked my mom what was on his face, and she told me those were stockings, something women used to wear on their legs before pantyhose became popular. I wasn't really worried about their purpose, but finally knowing what I had seen gave me a great feeling of relief. I was glad to know that we hadn't been stopped by some freaky looking monster. This epiphany unfortunately reopened another far more terrifying idea from the past. The possibility that Brian had been killed by that guy in the mask. I had grown up since then and I'd seen enough movies to know that kids get taken out by creepy strangers all the time and nobody knows it. I remember I had asked Steve a few days later what had happened after we split up. He told me that the man did follow them at first, but the point at which they separated at his house, the man was nowhere to be seen. They both just assumed he gave up or went after some other kids. Brian walked off toward home and that was the last time he saw him. I know I never saw that scary guy again, but I'm sure none of the other guys had either. I have no doubt they would have said something if they had. Sitting here the last few days and writing this all down, I've been reminded of a lot of great memories and a few terrible ones from my childhood. Even though I've had my fair share of terrifying occurrences in my life, and I may share some of those in the future, the hair-raising events of that night and the tragic ones that would follow were the first to leave an actual permanent scar on my memory. To this day, I still can't be sure what was the real cause of my friend's death. I've often turned the facts over in my mind just getting there, we have to decide who or what was actually chasing us that night. Friend, foe, or perhaps something we've yet to identify. I recognize that this question is much less important than the how, but nonetheless, it still plays a part in the mystery. 
reaching the true goal, we can finally ask the how. Was Brian pushed to his death by the man in black? Did he truly just trip on his bag of candy while running as quickly as his short little legs could carry him while wearing a vision obstructing mask in the dark? Not to mention, carrying the terror with him of being pursued by an unknown entity, always expecting it or him to pop up out of nowhere. Maybe this thing renewed its chase and Brian, out of sheer terror, flung himself from the cliff, not thinking of the drop-off ahead of him. Heck, it could have been caused by something I hadn't even considered yet, or all of these things at the same time. I'm doubtful that myself or anyone will ever know the truth of how Brian lost his life. I haven't even really discussed the possibilities of this all being the result of some prank gone horribly wrong and the teenagers were way too terrified to come forward and take the blame. At the end of the day, I haven't even considered the chance of this anonymous person abducting him, doing his awful act, and disposing of his body where he was found. As you can see, the web surrounding this mystery is elaborate indeed, but when it comes to me, I think I've achieved my goal of passing the facts on to you the way I remember them. I think this is where I'll bow out and leave this enigma for another person to muddle over, at least for today. Happy Halloween, and thanks for listening. With Halloween coming around, I thought I would share something terrifying that happened to me a few Halloweens back. While it doesn't involve creepy ghosts or monsters, I guarantee it terrified the life out of me and still does today. At the time this happened, I wasn't currently enrolled in school, but most of my friends were attending our local county community college. Four of them. Two guys and two girls have been living together in a house roughly two miles away from the campus. In the early weeks of October, I received a text from one of them saying that they were planning a big party the weekend before the 31st at their house and I was invited. I said yes, of course, and made sure to tell my boss I would be taking that weekend off. Normally, I would have gotten a bunch of pushback, but I had accrued more than enough vacation time to cover it. A couple of days prior to the party, I realized I would be attending the party alone and that's certainly no fun, so I asked one of the girls from work to join me. She didn't want to go without her boyfriend, so I reluctantly agreed. I wasn't trying to complain, I just simply didn't know the guy. I've never liked drinking around people I didn't know, so I was relying on my other friends to protect me from anything creepy happening. The night of the party arrived, and I chose to show up a little early so I could help my friends get everything in order. A few hours later, the other attendees began trickling in and by 10 or so, the party was raging. Sometime after 11, the first keg was floated. One of the guys at the party helped me tap the other one and pump out the foam. Since he was the one with the nozzle, I handed him my cup to fill. At exactly the same time, a friend I had not seen in years came up and said hi. When I looked back to the keg, the guy had filled my cup and handed it to me. Being a nice little girl, I thanked him and my friend and I walked off to catch up. We spoke for a good 15 or 20 minutes before nature called. After I peed, I began feeling really tired. Considering I'd been drinking for several hours, I figured I just needed to rest until I got my second wind. I searched a couple of rooms before I found an unoccupied bed I could lay on. After I closed my eyes, I don't remember anything other than what I thought was a dream of my friend's boyfriend throwing me on his back. I remember thinking it was a real weird thing to dream about. My next memory is of a bright, cold room. People's voices faded in and out, similar to tuning a radio. When I opened my eyes and the room came into focus, the urge to vomit overtook me. After I barfed, I heard the voice of my work friend next to me. I remember specifically I wanted to say something, but I was way too tired to stay awake. I must have fallen asleep again and slept for a while because when I woke up, the sun was shining in my face. It was so bright it made me sick to my stomach. Now I was much more coherent, but I felt like I had the worst hangover in history. My friend's voice was there again. I fought the heavy feeling in my eyelids until I could finally get a clear look at my surroundings. I was in what appeared to be a hospital room. The girl from work and her boyfriend stood next to my bed and they both had a happy but still concerned look. At first, I tried to speak, but my throat felt super rough and congested. I cleared my throat and asked, What happened? Did I get alcohol poisoning or something? Every word hurt to say and my voice resembled tires on gravel road when I heard it. No, I'm sorry, honey, but it, 
It looks like somebody roofied you. Don't worry though, no one assaulted you. you just, just get some sleep and we'll talk about it all when you're feeling better. I was concerned about what I just heard, but she fortunately said nothing happened, so I wasn't too terrified, at least not at the time. Sleep took me once more, and other than waking up once or twice briefly, I slept through the night. That morning I was far more lucid, but the sick feeling was still with me. When I opened my eyes, my friend from work was still there standing at the foot of my bed, but at least now she had a smile on her face. I found out later she went home for the night and returned that morning. How do you feel? I let her know I felt much better and we spoke a little while before the nurse came back in with food. Not much of it got eaten, but I was thankful for a cup of orange juice that came with it. This was the first time we'd been able to really talk since it happened, so she briefly laid things out for me. The following will be her words describing the events of that night. Jeff and I hadn't seen you for a while and I became curious of where you were and a little worried. I made Jeff come with me as I waited through the party, asking people if they had seen you or knew where you were. Everyone said no, so I began looking, going room to room, checking if you were in one of them. When I came to the third door, I opened it and saw two guys standing over a girl who was asleep on the bed. I took a couple of steps into the room and saw that it was you. When I looked at the guys, they both had a sheepish look on their faces like little boys who had been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. This made me really uncomfortable. Jeff must have known what they were up to because he walked up behind them, looked them in the eyes and told them that unless they wanted to get the life beat out of them, they better leave. That's just what they did. I didn't recognize either of them, but you may. If we see them around again, I'll point them out to you. I tried to wake you up, but you wouldn't move. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't get you to wake up. What little energy you had, you used to fight me. This is why I had a feeling you'd been drugged. I asked Jeff to help me get you out of there into the hospital. I was certain your condition wasn't due to beer. I'd spoken to you less than an hour before we found you and you looked completely sober. Since I hadn't much luck in getting you to wake, Jeff just picked you up and threw you over his shoulder, kind of like a bag of flour. Despite the context, I couldn't help but chuckle. You fought him a little, but nothing he couldn't handle. We whisked you away to our car and brought you to the ER. They did some tests and they came back positive for a cocktail of roofies and a couple of other drugs. The doctor said you were lucky because combining those amounts of drugs with alcohol could have easily have killed you. I didn't mention what situation we had found you in at first, but once the test came back, it seemed like the right thing to do. They contacted the police and Jeff and I spoke to a couple of officers about the party and how we found you. Since you're awake now, don't be surprised if they pay you a visit. That's it. Everything up until today. Now that I've heard about how close I came to being assaulted, I was starting to freak out. I didn't hesitate to thank her and tell her to tell Jeff how truly thankful I was, just like she suspected. Two cops showed up later that day, a few hours before I was discharged. I honestly didn't know how I'd been drugged and couldn't think of anyone who would have wanted to do that to me. Of course, my mind was still a bit hazy. I promised them if I remembered anything I'd call them right away. When I made it back home, I figured I should call my boss and tell him I needed a few more days off. But when he got on the phone, he was very compassionate towards me. He mentioned that Gail, my friend from work, had already contacted him and explained my situation. He told me I could take as much time as I needed and hoped that I was feeling better. After I thanked him, I hung up. Never in my entire life had I ever expected that man to show anything other than contempt toward me. Goes to show some people aren't all that bad, and sometimes they can surprise you. That evening, I had a little to eat and turned in just after 8. The next day was spent curled up on the couch watching Netflix. At lunchtime, I was able to eat an entire sandwich. It was nice being able to get my appetite back. Since my stomach was still growling a bit, I checked the cupboard for some snacks and noticed a pack of red Solo cups out of the corner of the eye and then BAM. It all came back like a gunshot. The guy who had helped me with the keg was staring me in the face. Then the entire scene replayed in my mind. My friend coming up behind me and saying hi. I turned away to talk to her and look back to see the same guy holding out a red solo cup. I take it and say thank you. In less than an hour, I was unconscious. He had to have been the guy that drugged me. 
The only problem was I didn't know his name or even who he was. I'd never even seen him before. I do remember that he was cute and I was planning to strike up a conversation, but that was before my old friend interrupted. Now that I had a good idea of the culprits, I was excited to tell the officers. Then the realization hit me it would be a pointless exercise without a name. Thinking on my feet, I quickly called up one of my friends that lived in the house. She didn't even know about what had happened to me. Some friend. No matter. I asked if she knew who the guy was, but she didn't. She did offer to ask the other three roommates, but when she returned to the phone, she said none of them had any idea who he was. It's likely he was just a crasher or was a guest of another student. This sunk my hopes of solving the case quickly. I didn't bother to call the officers and tell them. My only real hope now was that someone turned him in, but I wasn't holding my breath. It is possible he was one of the two males in the bedroom with me, but Gail nor Jeff recognized them. It looked like I was SOL. That's how it all ends up, pretty much. I went on with my life and done my best to put the whole terrible mess behind me. I do admit that I was real shaken up a while, but I've made an effort to use it as a learning experience. Since then, I've separated myself from that group of people and stopped going out to drink. I'd known them for a long time, but their indifference towards the girl's safety at their party made me so angry that I just began to think less of them. It's been almost three years since that party and I've never heard from the officers again. As I expected, nothing ever happened. This Halloween will be a quiet one for me, celebrated at home with my boyfriend. If you go out, be safe and don't drive if you're drinking. If you're a female, be very careful. Don't let your drink out of your sight. Don't take a drink from anyone, sealed or not. Most importantly, don't drink too much and lose control, especially around strangers. No matter the environment, that one heartless creep could be waiting for the right opportunity to make us move. Don't become a statistic. Each year around Halloween, my family gets together to tell the scariest stories we can find. Each member is responsible for one true story. The only rules are that the story must be fact and that it can't have ever been told before. With this year's storytelling get together growing ever closer, I was finding it especially hard discovering a story. Nearing my wit's end, I took a trip to the local library in search of a spine tingling gem from our misty past. Hours were spent in search of the perfect story until my attention was drawn to a small and unassuming headline on the corner of one page. It read, Daniel's Mansion Fire Cause Unknown. Continuing to read through the article only caused more questions. Reaching the bottom of a four hour long rabbit hole uncovered a shocking story of revenge that convinced me I'd found the story I'd been looking for. About a month from now, I will be sitting in my parents' living room, sharing with them the tale I've discovered. As I thought forward to this night, I figured I'd share this little known story with others, hoping to add an air of creepiness to their holidays too. So if you're ready, turn out the lights, kick back and enjoy the story I've chosen to call A Trial by Fire. The time is 1933 and our setting is in rural Kansas. A record-breaking heat wave and drought have led to crippling crop failures across the Great Plains. Signs of the so-called black blizzards, mile-wide dust storms comprised of topsoil were beginning to be observed. Because of this series of catastrophic environmental events, paired with a national economic depression, many families were losing their farms to locally owned banks. These banks, or more so their owners, were often seen as opportunistic vampires taking advantage of the farmers' increasingly bad luck, sucking them dry of what little they did have. In our town, the local bogeyman bank owner was named Saul Daniels, and although he was not as predatory as many bankers, he was despised nonetheless. Not as much for his habit of foreclosure and eviction of those farmers too far in arrears, but more for his agonizing inability to never deny his son anything he wished. Abe Daniels was the textbook example of a spoiled child and his constant worsening behavior because of this saw him grow from an annoying, whining little brat into a universally hated adult. He never let an opportunity to take what he wanted pass by. Any merchant in town doing business with his family's bank would ever be safe from Abe's predatory behavior. He would often brazenly walk right into a business owner's store and take what he wanted off the shelf. 
No one who owed the Daniels Bank, no matter the amount, would dare stop him from fear of losing the tiny bit of whatever they had managed to hold on to. Abe's desires were not limited to mere objects on the shelf. His childish mind would sometimes focus on an unlucky woman. As you would expect, they were also nothing more than objects to him. He made it clear to every girl he chose that she was helpless against his desires. The foolish few who fought his attention found themselves homeless overnight. Probably the worst example of his malevolent acts on females was that of Miss Natalie O'Leary. Miss O'Leary was a young school teacher. She had moved into the area only the year before and was soon to be marrying a young man named Martin Clark. By all accounts, the couple were very much in love. One Sunday morning, Miss O'Leary caught the attention of Abe outside of her church, and at that second, her fate would be sealed. He finally caught up with her a few mornings later at the Thompson family restaurant as she ate her breakfast. Being very familiar with Abe and his mistreatment of other women, she attempted to pay her check and leave before he could approach her. She wasn't quick enough, however, and Abe was on to her. He accosted her with a number of unseemly comments and propositions far too crude for me to repeat here. Miss O'Leary retained her ladylike demeanor as long as she could, until Abe slapped and grabbed her backside right in front of everyone. This was when she lost her temper and returned the disrespect by slapping him across his face. It was clear that he wasn't prepared for such a reaction. No one had ever dared to put their hands on him. The shock and rage radiated from him almost as brightly as the handprint on his cheek. Abe must have been unsure of how to deal with the situation and stormed out of the restaurant without a word. Everyone there that morning did their best to warn Miss O'Leary of the danger she was in, but she didn't take their warning seriously. No man or woman could strike Abe Daniels in front of witnesses and not expect severe repercussions. Severe repercussions were exactly what she would receive. Miss O'Leary's body was discovered five days later in an irrigation ditch just outside of town. She had been struck about the head at least 15 times. Various bones throughout her body had been broken so badly that the pathologist, Don Atkins, said that they were like those he'd seen in head-on auto collisions. The worst was perhaps that she had clear signs of being violently ravaged some time soon before her death. This crime shocked the entire county and surrounding counties and was surely the worst ever to occur up to that time. Miss O'Leary had been loved and respected by most who knew her and had no known enemies. Every citizen was greatly angered by her death and demanded the killer be brought to justice swiftly. The sheriff's initial suspect was Martin, her fiancé, despite his guilt being doubted by most. He had been seen arguing with Miss O'Leary after church that Sunday but this turned out to be a misidentification of another couple by a nearly blind woman. Although he was doing his best to put this on Mr. Clark, he was soon forced to acknowledge to the press that he had no evidence he had committed it. It was no secret around town that Abe had assaulted Miss O'Leary earlier in the week and she had struck him in front of at least ten witnesses. He had to have been the only enemy she had had as far as anyone knew of. This made him the prime suspect in most folks' minds. It took massive pressure from severe powerful members of the town before the sheriff would bring Abe in for questioning, and even then, he was quickly released with no charges. The sheriff's rapid exoneration of Abe infuriated those who were positive of his guilt. It didn't take long for the rumors to begin making the rounds, claiming to know the actual reason of Abe's release. An unnamed gentleman at the bank provided information that claimed a veiled threat was made to the sheriff regarding the deed to his parents' farm. They were said to be several months behind in their payments to the bank, and this gentleman claimed Saul had threatened to foreclose on them if any charges were brought up on Abe. It was common knowledge that the Daniels Bank owned the deeds to the majority of the land in town and the county surrounding it. Whether Saul had made such a threat could never be proven, but most who had heard it had little doubt it was. After the release of Abe Daniels, the case of Miss O'Leary went dormant and remains formally unsolved to this day. Even though most were confident of Abe's guilt, without any real evidence or support of law enforcement, there was nothing they could do. Therefore, they were forced to bite the bullet and move on with their lives, praying one day a big break would come along and justice would be done. There was no doubt, especially after reading all of the myriad number of awful things the Daniels men did, 
some by Abe and some by Saul, that this family were the prime example of ultimate power and the blatant abuse of this power. However, there is one aspect of this story that we cannot leave out, and that is the widespread racism aimed at the family. Kansas has a long history of supporting minorities that goes back at least to the 1850s when bloody battles would break out between the anti-slavery elements in the state and the pro-slavery ones in the surrounding state of Missouri. These skirmishes would continue all the way until the ending of the Civil War in 1865. Even in a usually open-minded and inclusive area, the distrust felt toward the Jewish family was widespread. There was a time in which this was not true. In the early 1890s when Saul Daniels first arrived in the area, he was welcomed with open arms. The county lacked any type of banking system and Daniels' arrival was seen by many as a gift from God. While not being wealthy himself, he received the backing of several of the county's wealthier landowners. By 1907, the Daniels Farmers and Cattlemen Bank owned half of the town's properties and surrounding farms. This is around the time attitudes towards Saul and the rest of the family began to turn sour. Many of the men that had supported Saul in his early years had lost their fortunes in subsequent financial panics, but he had continued to invest his money wisely and grow into a man they could only have dreamed of once being. A few of these men had approached Saul for loans but found themselves being rebuked by him for being foolish with their investments. Those men believed they were owed the money for helping him in his time of greatest need. This was likely the root of the bad feeling felt towards them and reinforced the stereotype many of them had of the greedy Jew in their minds. In the following decades, the rising anti-Semitism in Europe was brought to the New World with the immigrants coming west. A prevailing ignorance of the people and their religious practices only served to drive the two groups further apart. Stories of practices like child sacrifice, no matter how ridiculous, were being spread freely throughout the community. Saul and his spoiled son were not the only Daniel's family members to suffer from this spreading prejudice. The matriarch of the family, Rebecca, despite being relatively liked in town, was often treated like a second-class citizen. This treatment ranged from being passed over in favor of other shoppers in the Baxter Mercantile to children's blatant name-calling in the street. Rebecca, being a meek yet kind little woman, took all this abuse in stride. Saul was certainly made aware of the way his beloved wife was being treated. This may have been the prime motivation behind the coldness he showed toward them. This bitterness grew worse in 1918 when Rebecca succumbed to the Spanish flu and his only son, Abraham, also did as well. It was said at the time that the only thing Saul Daniels loved more than money was his family. Most think Rebecca was the only moderating influence on Saul. So, her loss removed any amount of kindness he may have still felt for his neighbors. The boom that followed the Great War continued Saul on his trajectory to boundless wealth. As you can imagine, his ever-expanding net worth made him more and more hated by his neighbors. This period of amazing prosperity just happened to coincide with Abe's ascendance into young manhood. Rebecca's moderating influence could have possibly worked to rein in his more childish impulses, but without her around, Abe's near death made Saul virtually unable to deny him anything, regardless of the cost to himself or others. But not only did he have his own staple of racehorses and automobiles, but he would often purchase them for his group of hangers-on, only to take them away and destroy them right in front of the person if they angered him in any way. He was said to have bought seven cars in one year, only to go on and crash them soon after. Following his clearance in the death of Miss Natalie O'Leary, Abe left for an extended vacation to Europe. This should have been a period of relief for the town's inhabitants, but the vile actions of Saul would force the town to make a choice many never believed themselves capable of. Mrs. Mabel Reed was an elderly lady living on the 150-acre farm her husband had purchased from the Daniels Bank in 1927. Less than two years later, he was thrown from a horse and killed, leaving Mrs. Reed, now a widow, three months for their son Grant to find work. In the deepest depths of the Great Depression, work anywhere was exceedingly rare. Hearing there were jobs aplenty in California, Grant hopped a train heading west. In his absence, Mrs. Reed did her best to make what was left stretch until Grant had found work. At the four and a half month mark, every cent was spent, and she had yet to hear anything from her son. She survived on store credits and the kindness of her fellow farmers. 
In a place where no one was getting by on farming, this was an especially generous act. After six months without a single letter from Grant, everyone but Mrs. Reed had lost hope. Things for her were looking very bleak. She was three months behind on her payments, and although this wasn't that long compared to many of those around her, she knew Saul could pounce on her at any second. The pounce came a mere week later. To this day, no one is sure what caused Saul to choose her for foreclosure. One theory was that he was missing his son, but the facts are none of us know his true motivations that day. He sent the sheriff out the morning of October 13th to serve her with a notice of foreclosure and assist her in the removal of her personal effects. Even after repeated requests from the sheriff to give her more time, Saul demanded he do the task quickly and quietly as possible. Unfortunately for Saul, knowledge of the foreclosure would quickly spread after Mrs. Reed's death from a heart attack while being served the notice. To his relief, the townsfolk didn't blame the sheriff for Mrs. Reed's death. They knew of the power Saul wielded over him. He was the man truly at fault for this. In almost every shred of misery that had happened the past 30 years could be traced back to him or his disgusting son. As if things weren't already awful, Grant Reed showed up on the morning train just two days later. With him, it was more than enough money to pay off the remainder of the deed. Upon being told of his mother's death and the circumstances surrounding it, he stepped silently back onto the train and returned west, permanently disappearing into history. The downfall of the Daniels family empire can probably be pinned down to this moment. The arrival of Grant Reed only two days too late was the last straw for most of the citizenry. A few people even proposed a theory that Saul had been alerted of this imminent arrival and foreclosed out of plain spite. Nothing shows this to be true, but it wouldn't be out of character for Saul Daniels or his son. Within hours of his return home, Abe was back to his usual behavior. At the time of Miss O'Leary's tragic death, he had been in an odd relationship with Miss Barbara Roberts, a daughter of Gerald Roberts, a member of the city council and owner of Roberts Men's Fine Clothing. Miss Roberts and her father became estranged soon after she and Abe began their counting of one another. Folks suggested that it was because she continued to see Abe after he had done all those things to her on their first date. Regardless of the true reason, just being believed to have assaulted the daughter of a well-respected member of the community and a well-loved one at that was enough to set his ultimate punishment in motion. With Halloween soon to arrive, the denizens of the town began to prepare for the worst. The holiday in the earlier parts of the 20th century were far different than it would turn out to be in the century's waning years. What had been more of an adult-oriented occasion had begun its drastic switch towards a more child-centered celebration. Although the tradition of trick-or-treating had already began for the younger ones, another much more juvenile pattern of behavior was common among the older children. In this period, the Night of All Hallows' Eve had the more popular name of Mischief Night, and the night very often lived up to this name. Vandalism was the norm in much of the country and proved to be very costly to the communities in which it occurred. What was once seen as boys will be boys started to be viewed in a more serious light. It took the coming of a war and a concerted effort to divert the attention of the destructive to less expensive hobbies. To this day, groups of energetic boys still roam neighborhoods on Halloween, cruising for things to smash, but Compared to these same areas in the 1930s, this behavior has all but ceased to be a real concern. The week leading up to the 31st was consumed by multiple private meetings. These meetings were held in the homes of the few remaining wealthy and powerful people that weren't named Daniels. At the time, anyone not involved in them was left with the assumption that they were related to the yearly celebrations of Halloween, specifically the Fall Festival and Halloween Parade held each year around this time. No one on the inside attempted to check this belief, and because of this, what was to occur on the night of Halloween was able to be pulled off without the targets getting any prior warning. Just to remove any chance of rumor, a city meeting was held at the school to announce the town's plans for the holidays. This was open to the public. A large part of the meeting covered the city's father's plans to decrease the expected rash of vandalism that coming Tuesday. That Friday, the Fall Festival Parade was held downtown and the night everybody had been preparing for and dreading finally arrived on Tuesday. While families held parties and opened their homes to the throngs of little trick-or-treaters, 
hordes of teenage boys swarmed about the town, toilet papering trees, and smashing every jack-o'-lantern they came across. Later that night, as they slept, the fire at the Daniels' massive home on the outskirts of town began to blaze. No matter how much water the firemen dumped on it, it deemed they had arrived too late to save the home. They'd also arrived too late to save the two Daniels men, Saul and Abe. It had been one of their servants, Rose Blackmore, who had called out the fire department. But from what was discovered after, neither of the men made it out of the house alive. Also, Abe had managed to make it to the front door. He succumbed to smoke before he could escape the flames. As for Saul, he never made it out of his room. It didn't take long before questions began to arise as to the cause of the fire. Firemen had discovered the remnants of two or three jack-o'-lanterns that had been smashed on the front porch. However, it was common knowledge that Daniels did not celebrate the holiday and had never decorated their home for any holiday, even back before the death of Rebecca. Within two days of the start of the investigation, an unnamed firefighter came forward and said that when he first arrived, he had noticed a chain on the front doors. But when he had come back with the fire chief to show him, the chain was gone. The chief laughed this off as delusions from the heat and told the firefighter to shut up and get back to work. Later, when he discovered a similar looking length of chain under the bushes, his suspicions were reinforced. This piece of information intrigued the sheriff as he hadn't come across any chain during the course of his investigation. Desperate for any lead, the sheriff brought every man present that night in for questioning, but no one would admit to seeing anything out of the ordinary. Weeks passed with no clues, so the cause of the fire was ruled as an accident due to criminal mischief. Although no one had seen any kids in the area, not to mention with pumpkins, it was the closest to a resolution he could find. It was obvious nobody was going to ruin some kid's life over a stupid accident. Besides, no tears were going to be shed over the loss of that despicable family. The sheriff already had his hands full with cattle thefts and poaching. He wasn't going to be able to waste any more time on a dead-end case. So he packed up the file and moved on. As the years passed and people came and went, an occasional story about that night would drift into his office. Some of the things were just too outlandish to give any credence to, but a few matched things he'd heard before had been suspicious about then. An anonymous letter arrived in his office alleged to be from someone who'd heard the truth of the fire from someone involved in it, but without any names, he was right where he'd started. The first real break arrived in 1938. He'd been summoned to the sick bed of Ellis Norton. He claimed to have something important to get off his chest before he met his maker. The story Sheriff James heard that night would only create more questions than he had before. Ellis claimed that after the death of Mabel Reed and the rumors of Barbara Roberts' assault, folks had had enough. They began meeting in small groups gradually bringing someone else into the conspiracy. No actual plan was created until the Sunday evening before Halloween. After services that night, everyone decided on what action they would take and when. The 31st had seemed the perfect time to send those two evil SOBs back to hell where they came from. Sometime after midnight on the 31st, everyone gathered downtown and took the short walk to the Daniels place. To ensure that they would be unable to flee the house when the fire started, any and every door and window was rendered unusable. Norton didn't indicate how exactly this was all done, but did mention that both doors had been chained shut. When they were confident Saul and Abe were trapped, a large amount of kerosene was poured all over the porch and several jack o lanterns were lit and thrown onto the kerosene. Once the blaze had fully taken hold, Rose Blackmore was phoned anonymously and told to call the fire department. Mrs. Blackmore had made no mention of this phone call back in 1933, but may have been in league with the others in protecting them. Since she had passed in 1936, the sheriff couldn't ask her. Ellis also recounted hearing the screams of Abe Daniels as he burned alive. The sheriff's hopes were soon to be dashed when he came to the question everyone wanted to know. Who was involved? This answer Ellis could not provide. He had sworn on his soul that he would never say, and this was an oath he was willing to honor to the grave. The only thing he would say was that it was everyone and no one at the same time. When the sheriff begged himself to explain, he simply said there wasn't a single person who was not there that night and that everyone was involved. These words ended up being Ellis Norton's last. 
Later that night, he passed away in his sleep, leaving the sheriff even more confused than he had been that night five years ago. Even though he finally knew what happened that Halloween, he was no closer to an arrest. There was no way he could arrest the entire town, and they knew it. From all that he had learned over the years, it looked like everyone from the Daniels maid to most of the fire department played some part in the murder. He would go on to let it be known around the town that he was fully aware of what had occurred. Not even he knew why he had did this. Could have been in a vain attempt to scare someone into talking, but no matter the reason, he would retire never having the answer to the questions that mattered. Supposedly, even on his deathbed, it was said that case was on his mind. One particular sensational story claims his last words were, please, just one name. Whether this actually happened or had anything to do with the Daniels murders, we'll never know. One thing is certain, however, on a Halloween night in 1933, an entire town took it upon themselves to dole out the justice they had been deprived of for so long and did it in an especially brutal way. The fact they did this to one of the most powerful families in the entire state of Kansas, and nobody cared enough to punish them for it, just goes to show you how truly terrifying these two men must have really been. Being unsure of how to begin this story, I figured the best way would be to just come out and get to the point. On Halloween night, I was 12. I almost killed my best friend. Rather blunt, I know, but it happens to be completely true. I do suppose I should probably provide a bit of context so everyone reading or hearing this won't go away with the impression I'm a total psycho. I'll do my best to explain myself in this situation without being too long-winded. The story goes something like this. The house I grew up in was located on 30 acres, about 6 miles outside of the nearest town. It had been in my family since just after the Civil War when my Confederate veteran ancestor moved to the state from Louisiana. The first house that he built upon buying the land burned down within five years, so he was forced to build the one my family had been inhabiting for the past 140 plus years. It wasn't anything grand, but was enough for my parents and I to be happy in. The distance from town meant I had to take the school bus back and forth every day, and I didn't have many friends close by to play with. Some weekends I would spend in town with kids from school and others, those friends would ride the bus home with me and spend the weekend on our farm. As a teenager, I didn't think there was anything to do, but as a younger kid, we never ran out of things to occupy us. One specific weekend happened to coincide with Halloween, so my folks told me to invite a handful of kids out to the farm. Obviously, we couldn't trick-or-treat in the middle of nowhere. My folks loaded us all into the suburban and brought us into town where they were having some kind of candy handout at the mall. When it was over, we went back to the farm and played some games on my PlayStation for a while. That got boring eventually and asked if we could go outside and play hide-and-seek. My mom said yes, but we had to be back by 11 p.m. I'd always had less restraints on me when I was growing up. Being out in the country meant you had to allow your children more freedom than to the kids in town. Where I grew up running the woods, hunting rabbits and squirrels, and walking miles across open fields to go fishing was the norm. Most of my friends couldn't even leave their yard without an adult going along. I can only assume that's how everyone in the family grew up and my parents didn't see anything wrong or dangerous in it. The night was a perfect one for hide and seek. The temperature had yet to grow cold and there hadn't been any rain in several weeks. I gathered all the boys in a circle and laid out the boundaries and rules for the game. A few of them had stayed over the night before, so they were pretty familiar with the area. I guess at this point I should mention that our house stood across the road from an old 19th century cemetery used by the surrounding farm families. It was used all the way up until the 1960s when they ran out of space to bury the dead. I'd grown up next to it so I wasn't scared to play there, but when I mentioned that it was inside the hiding boundaries, a couple of the boys got kind of freaked out. I assured them the place wasn't haunted and only after a lot of coaxing and a small bit of shaming, I convinced them to play. We played a few quick games of rock, paper, scissors until we had our seeker and began the game. Me and another boy ran straight for the cemetery and found our hiding places. I'm not sure where the others went. Once the seeker finished counting, he started the search. Two or three made it to the tree that served as a home base pretty fast. We in the cemetery were the last two left. 
The seeker was soon combing the cemetery for us. The boy that had hidden there with me blew past the kids seeking and made it home untouched. I tried to do the same thing, but the boy was ready this time and I became it. The game started again and when I finished counting I headed to the most used hiding spots first. I did have an obvious advantage, but lack of a moon made seeing in the dark very difficult. A few boys got past me within the first minute. You know the ones that hide so close to the home base they can almost touch it. There's always one or two of those in the game, but the remaining two were hidden really well. What seemed like ten minutes or so later, I still hadn't found them and I was beginning to get sick of looking. Right before I was about to give up, my best friend Troy popped up from under a rotten log on the edge of the cemetery and made a break for home. The hiding place he was in forced him to run away from the road and deeper into the cemetery. Then he cut back towards the road, bringing him dangerously close to me, but I missed him as he passed. We were both running our fastest, however, I was just a bit quicker and right on his tail. All he had to do was make it across the narrow road and the six or so feet to the tree and he was home free. We were perhaps just a little less than halfway across when this old blue and gray truck came barreling down the road. It was so close by the time I first saw it, I could have reached out and touched it. Maybe not, but darn near it. I did the only thing I could think of doing and threw my body against Troy's in the hopes I could knock him out of the path of the truck. I don't remember being worried about myself, just him. He was my best friend after all and I'd known him as long as I could remember anything. I slammed shoulder first into the ditch and it hurt like a mother. Almost positive the truck had run him over, I looked just in time to see Troy rolling toward me. Miraculously, he was okay other than a few scrapes and a little road rash. I pounced on him and checked for any signs that he had been hit but found none. My hands were shaking and I felt like I was about to barf but so relieved I started chuckling like a lunatic. I looked up the road and the truck was nowhere to be seen. This wasn't scary as much as confusing. It was after 10 o'clock at night and a truck I'd never seen came barreling out of nowhere down a road that saw maybe two or three cars during the course of the day and very rarely after dark. The thought sent a shiver through my body but wouldn't really begin to trouble me until much later. I helped Troy up and we did our best to shake the near miss off. The other boys were in utter disbelief that we'd survived and kept asking us if we were okay. I was a tad sore and I imagined Troy was about the same. Some of the boys were scared. I could tell by their expressions that they may start crying any minute. This was the last thing I wanted to happen. I repeatedly assured them that we were completely fine and there was no need to be upset and in a few minutes they began to calm down. I made all the boys promise not to tell anyone but especially not my parents what had happened. My biggest fear was that I wouldn't be able to play outside after dark anymore. Also, if the other guys' folks heard about it, they may not let them stay the weekend anymore. I barely had any friends as it was. The game was over for the night after that, and it was getting close to 11 anyway, so I called it. We returned to the house and played games until it was time to go to sleep. The remainder of the holiday, we spent our time building a fort in the woods behind the cemetery. That ended up being the last game of hide-and-seek for the year. Soon after the 1st of November, fall finally began in full. As we grew older, the weekends at the farm became fewer and fewer. A few of the boys there that night got to other friends and one boy, Nicholas, lost his life after his car was struck by a train at an unmarked crossing. Despite this, I look back at those days with an endless happiness. I still talk to Troy about it once a month. He's currently stationed at Fort Hood in Texas with his beautiful wife and two daughters. We never fail to laugh at how close we came to getting killed that night only to be overtaken by confusion and fear surrounding the circumstances in which it happened. As for me, I'm in the process of moving back to the farm with my new wife. My dad and I have been building us a new home a few acres away from the old one and hope to soon be moving in. I moved into town right out of school because I've been offered a job at one of the manufacturing places and stayed there until a month or two ago when I began my own business working out of the house. I told my wife many times how fun it was growing up there and we agreed there isn't any other place we'd want our kids to grow up in. Seeing as Halloween is coming up soon, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, not just Halloween. Don't forget the night is really for the kids. Let them have as much fun as possible while they still can. And one more thing, 
Please don't forget to remind them to look both ways when crossing the street. Not just when they're trick-or-treating. It should really apply to the rest of the time, too. <laughs>